The following is a production of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. The, the vehicle itself is a pickup truck that can carry a plethora of sensors. The pickup truck standard version of the iSpot, which is just called Remus 100, was just initially designed to be a near coastal vehicle that had the ability to survey um, the ocean, and so map out the seafloor, uh, look for shipwrecks, and measure currents and temperature and, and uh, just basic physical properties of the, of the ocean. The area we're interested in working in uh, is a very challenging one. Uh, the entire nature of the ice field that you're trying to work on can change in a matter of hours from something that's fairly benign and accessible, so kind of flat and just like you'd imagine uh, ice on a lake, uh, to something that's very complex, full of uh, ridges and, and uh, jagged ice edges, open water, cracks, and all kinds of other problematic things. As far as we know, this is the first time that people have tried to use a autonomous vehicle in this really rapidly changing, uh, very dynamic ice field with many uh, ridges and leads. One of the great benefits I had was being able to tap into the uh, engineering and field services groups at HUI and try to, again, start an yet more brainstorming sessions to understand what modifications we had to make to this vehicle so that we could uh, launch it, navigate it under the ice, and recover it uh, through, a, through a relatively small hole in the ice. If you're a model airplane buff, it's something like flying your, you can imagine flying your model airplane, but not even being able to see it or steer it with your little joysticks. In fact, you'd have to just send it on a pre-programmed mission, let it steer itself, fly out 10 miles, turn around, come back, and land in a shoebox. You know, it's kind of the, the challenge we set out for ourselves. The first thing I noticed when I got off the plane this particular time, and I'd been to Barrow before, was how cold it was. Um, 10 or 15 knot wind chill, um, which brought the temperature down to minus 52. But not only do the, do the people have to bundle up and put on multiple layers, but you've got to find a way to keep your equipment warm. The vehicle always had top priority of being warm. It was definitely well, probably warmer than most of us. We started out actually many months in advance and we contracted with a group called the Barrow Arctic Science Consortium, or BASC. And what BASC, their local uh, group that works right up in Barrow, Alaska, and what they can supply is people who really understand how to get to the ice, how to work on the ice, and how the ice changes, and how, it, uh, how stable it is, and how unstable it is. These ice ridges, these pressure ridges, they get up to about two stories. It's a good vantage point when you're uh, watching the ice and looking for bears. So, you know, they meticulously picked out this area, put the hole in, put the tent up, and set up a gantry, a tripod with a, um, a hoist that would make it easy to lift the vehicle, and then they seemed happy. We were feeling pretty good about things. One of the native guides then came by real quickly in, into our uh, warehouse where we were working and kind of said, I'm going back out to the ice. He opened up the doors, grabbed the snowmobile, backed it in, attached the wooden sled that was empty, and just took off. We didn't quite know what was going on. It turned out they knew uh, some things that we didn't know at the time, which was that the ice conditions were changing fast. Within, you know, the hour of them leaving the site, something about the wind changed and the current changed directions, enough for only, you know, a local uh, a native to just know that something was about to happen. He had the sixth sense. And so they went out and simultaneously this huge flow of ice had crashed into the ice shelf that we were working on and just completely destroyed the entire site. Uh, the forest was so great that it just took uh, all that ice and all of our snowmobile tracks and even piled it up vertical, uh, you know, four or five meters high. It, it, the fear was just in that moment of like, gosh, I'm glad we weren't out there. They came back just with pieces of tent and, and most of the gantry and it, it was kind of like, okay, let's rewind a little bit and rethink this. 
And I guess at that point, this big, perfect ice sheet that I had expected was just uh, a pipe dream, and I realized how dynamic the environment really was and that we had to be a little bit more nimble um, about our approach to things. By the time we had set up this uh, second camp, which was on this smaller kind of ice flow surrounded by ridges, not quite the environment we wanted, but it was the environment we had, um, we were ready to really exercise the vehicle now. Despite the 12 years of preparation, I was still kind of nervous to send this AUV off and uh, let it navigate by itself and come back and find the net. And I think, in retrospect, the, the caution of using the tether uh, became uh, our enemy. One of the guys started pulling back the, the line to recover the vehicle, as we had done so many times before. But this time, um, when they hauled up the, end of the uh, AUV, instead of finding the vehicle on the end of the line, they just found the end of the line, and the, the line had been cut uh, by the propeller. Who knows what happened? Your imagination runs wild when uh, you stop and you lose communications with it in that environment. Among the modifications we had done to the AUV was to outfit it with the ability to carry one of these avalanche beacons. And sure enough, um, this technique worked. And we were able to go out with a handheld receiver and find the transmitter, which was the equivalent of finding the AUV. I mean, if there wasn't any ice, it would have been, you know, 60 feet over there. But it seemed a million miles away. We eventually knew where it was uh, within a meter or so, maybe a meter or two. Um, and we decided that we would have to dig it out of the ice. We saw the vehicle with a pole camera. It was definitely a moment of, like, just totally elated. It was like, I felt like I found gold, like my pot, my pot of gold. I was like, yes, there it is. So we went out the next day preparing to basically do whatever it took to get the vehicle out. So because we didn't have the melter, but we had an ice pit and that ice saw, we were able to drill numerous holes basically right in front of the vehicle. Say the vehicle's here, you know, we, we drilled all these holes like this and we just connected the dots with this ice saw and pulled out all the ice chunks. And we found out that it was actually, there was two or three layers of ice that we had to go through and the vehicle happened to be in the middle layer. Using the ROV, we put that in the water and that was also another live camera feed. And the idea was, you know, we're going to try using the RV to swim up to the vehicle to be able to grab um, this cable here, which was what it was intended for. And you can see the vehicle sitting there, you know, totally floating positive up underneath this um, ice, ice wall. And I remember sitting there driving the ROV and looking at the screen and the, the hand of the manipulator just started, I was pulling the vehicle and it was moving out an inch, two inches, and for every inch the manipulator was just slipping off of the smooth surface and I was hoping that it would get stuck inside this little wedge of the harpoon but it didn't, it just slipped off and then the vehicle moved out a little bit. Came up with another rig to basically hook onto the vehicle and just you know pull it out of the hole. You are just using your mental toughness now to be able to to uh, manipulate the pole to get the line over the harpoon and Chris actually was able to get it on the harpoon and pulled up and it was sort of like you know you have to make sure that the line didn't slip off the hook and pull the vehicle up and it came up vertically and Peter and Chris just grabbed the vehicle and pulled it up out of the water. It's like pulling a small child out of an icy hole that had fallen through. It was just like, uh, it was an amazing moment. It took a long time, but I tell you, you know, it, it, was a, it was a big success story. That had never been done. Um, I mean, it was really jammed in there. I didn't, to be quite honest, I didn't think we were going to be able to get it back. After having had our first camp uh, destroyed, trying to work at a, at a on an ice floe that was small and surrounded by ridges, having lost a vehicle and dug it out and finally gotten it back. We finally now had learned maybe what we needed to learn to understand how to work in this environment. So it's coming back, right? <laughs> coming back. Here we go, Al. Uh, Bye, Remus. Bye-bye. No tether. Oh. Got it. Yes, yeah,
back. Coming back? It's coming back. Right on. For sure. For sure. It, it worked beautifully. It navigated just as we wanted it to along the pre-programmed track, uh, turned around, it was lined up beautifully on the net. We ran four missions in a completely autonomous mode with the vehicle, making surveys beneath this ice flow, uh, coming back, getting captured in the net, retrieved, and then deployed again. Science. Gotta love it. To learn more about Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, visit us on the web at www.whoi.edu.